42 rigs and I was average. So you just you group. just casually got invited to a, a, a wheeling event with 42 rigs because they fixed your Jeep? Yeah. That's and, sweet. And well, even more so is there wasn't a single Jeep that wasn't running 40s that wasn't at mm-hmm. least four and a half. Some of the, there was one that was basically a buggy. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Dirt Drive Podcast, your favorite podcast. This week, we are spinning the wheel of Dirt Nerd, and we are uh, in Sterling with actually our first customer that's been on the show, Dexter Jeeps <laughs> at the shop. Uh, Martin's here. Well, thanks for having me. Um, definitely a pleasure. And like any Jeep enthusiast, especially those off-road, I feel like the Jeep is always in the shop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I told my wife the other day, it is a cliche, but you know, her, her questions are whenever we come off the trail is, is, did you break anything and what did you break? And and I told her, I don't see it as breaking things. I like to think of it more as testing for weakness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Looking for the weakest link. Yeah. Um, I've been lucky. I haven't, so I haven't been rock crawling much recently. I mean, I still have my rock crawling. My Cherokee has been broken for a year. Um, but with the JK, with the, the light stuff we've been doing, the, the adventure wheeling overlanding stuff, I mean, I broke a front drive shaft. It was the the, the factory drive shaft, the, the Red Zeppa. The 30? Uh, yeah, for the, the 30, but it was the, the drive shaft coming out of the transfer case. The Red Zeppa went out, and it was clicking real bad, and I'm like, but I had I had an Adams drive shaft at home for it that... But it was at home. <laughs> yeah, it was at home, but it also doesn't matter because if you're not in full-wheel drive, you're not using the front drive shaft. True. Unlike unlike the, it still spins on like the JL. The JL still, or the JL doesn't spin because it's got that center axle disconnect. The JK the the drive shaft always spins, so it was clicking the whole time. But eh, not too bad. Well, I, I will tell you, we we uh, we're actually on our seventh Jeep. Um, Dude, you got a horde of them. We do. Um, we, we well, we're we're down to two JLs and a JK. But prior to that. Uh, a lot of Cherokees. That's so um, many. That's so many Jeeps. So well, three you, Jeeps is too many Jeeps. That's awesome. I love it. But we're also spanning like thirty years. Yeah. Right. So um, that being said, the most recent uh, is a 2019 JL Rubicon um, that we purchased in 2019. And is that the red one you showed up in? No, that's the white one. Oh, it's the white one. Okay. Uh, AKA Sub Zero. Which um, well, fun story about that. It, it, it was named by my wife because of its colors. It's an all white Jeep. And I would say before that trend really took off. Yeah, naming uh, them. And it became one of a million. Um, oh, the all white, not naming it. Yeah. The all yeah. white. Okay. Because my Jeep is also all white. My JK is also all white. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. So. Uh, well, you have a black hard top or a, you have soft a soft top. top. Yep. You have a black soft top. So I've got the. I, when I bought my Jeep, it had white bumpers front and rear. And the white hardtop and the white fenders. And I'm like, I can't do this. So we did the white hardtop, but I reached a point where I basically never put it back on. I mean, looking back, I probably would have just should have just skipped it. But um, there were so many incentives in 2019 that now you there's no way in hell you could get the same Jeep for the same price. Right. Um, but that being said, the name in her mind, you know, she was thinking snow and, you know, sub zero temperatures and things like that. And I was thinking Mortal Kombat. That's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, she has no idea it's Mortal Kombat, does she? No, no. So the movie, when the movie came out a couple of years later, we're, we're walking out of the theater and, you know, of course I went to see it. And we're on the way out and she looks over at me and she goes, is that, is that why you agreed? So quickly. Is that why you agreed so quickly? (laughs) Absolutely. But it's funny over the years, everybody's like the Jeep's the wrong color, right? It should be blue. Um, I don't even know the name. Do you have blue blue. on there other than the the name? Okay. Nope. And, uh, but, but that being said, it kind of stuck. I mean, we call it subs for short and, um, I went ahead and just went with it, but the original idea behind this is, you know, I grew up in Texas, um, drove, you know, Chevy pickups all through high mm-hmm. school and 
prior to joining the Navy. You're, kind man, of thing. you're a man after my own heart. I've had, I've only had Chevys and Jeeps my entire life. Right. So my dad, um, after the first time I buried my truck, when I think I was 15, um, uh, he took the front drive shaft out. He said, if you can't do it with rear wheel drive, two wheel drive, then you don't deserve four. So, had to be real careful. We didn't have trails like we do here. It was really just we played in the mud and yeah, power lines played in the mud. Yeah, <laughs> and it wasn't illegal back then because it wasn't posted back then. Nope. That's how that's how it was when I grew up. Is before everything got real shut down hard. As we wheeled power lines in my dad's CJ, and we just we we had a farm behind the house in uh, Virginia Beach, and we we the, we had got property from the farm owner. We just wheeled in the in the washouts and everything at the farm man so the sam houston national forest just outside of huntsville texas and, and conroe texas and up in that area um there's a lot of a lot of rain comes through uh and you know the trinity river is not far down the road and anybody that's in texas um during you know spring and, and summer every every time you turn on the news the river's flooding kind of mm-hmm. deal so those tributaries and runoffs um, hit the forest and, you know, a lot of folks land will get uh, pretty overrun and flooded and we would go play in it. <laughs> um, but that being said, moving on kind of into the Navy days, I had a Humvee that I drove uh, in my battalion and I just kind of fell in love with the things that it could do, mm-hmm. right? From, a, um, what do you call it, HMV highly mobile multi-wheeled vehicle model one yeah right um just yeah the, through, the, the shit version of the h1 well so i had all fiberglass took the doors off oh shit okay uh, yeah we because every every time i i mention i've got a buddy who's a marine and every time i mention a, a humvee he's like they were the worst because he was a he was a mechanic he's like those are the worst thing and then we saw one at work we saw an h1 they're beautiful they're and they're amazing. well built so, so the, the the stark difference between the Humvee and the H one is is wild. Oh, it's incredible. Well, so what's what's funny is is um, so I drove them. I drove the same one throughout Afghanistan and then uh, all over Iraq. And so I was with the CBs, and we take all our equipment with us mm-hmm. everywhere we go. So washed it down in Kuwait, took it back to the U.S., then brought it back, and you know, fast forward basically. 20 years later, um, not quite 20 years, was so, so about 18 years later, um, I kind of wanted to recreate that experience a little bit to have a vehicle that could sort of operate and act in the same manner. So we started with the 2019 JL. Um, and the other side of it was wanted to do something unique and different with the family. Yep. And so we started hitting the trails together. Um, and we came across the. So your first Jeep was not your first Jeep, but your first family rig was the the, J, the white JL Sub Zero. It was. Wow. Okay. Um, so prior to that, uh, JKs, XJs, um, but, but that was all exploring just with yourself and maybe your wife going out and hitting the trails. Nah, not that, even, that not was just that. me. Um, okay. Mainly to work and back daily drivers. A um, little bit of off roading in Tennessee, but not much. Um, like maybe once a month I might go out and hit a trail. But the family kind of, my daughters and my son and my wife kind of fell in love with it right away. And I was like, okay. Well, then here comes COVID, mm-hmm. right? And by the time COVID hit, we had done a three and a half inch Evo long arm kit. Um, went from 35s to 37s. Ironically, in 19, it came with 35s. Yep. So... Upgraded it. We put the Terraflex Nomad um, self deflators on there, uh, which love those. As gimmicky as they are, they save a lot of time. (laughs) Um, Skid plates throughout because I destroyed a lot early on uh, and and did the the metal cloak skid plates um, with the Under Armour. But when when COVID kind of hit and everybody really, what I'll say is locked down, Mm -hmm. we went out. Yeah, a lot of right. people did. It was surprising. So I was guiding at the Cove at the time for big dogs. And when COVID started, the amount of new Jeeps that were on the trails, I had, at, I mean, Tom says it all the time, but we had, so, so Tom was a guide and I was a guide. Between 
the two of us, my Jeep had a, or my group had a million dollars worth of Jeeps in it, and Tom's group had a million dollars worth of Jeeps in it. It was all brand new jails, jail room cons. Damn. And I do remember, I will tell you, and I don't know if I was a part of this, but I tried to explain to my wife the difference between the two doors, four doors, the JKs and the jails. And I basically told her, I said, you know, there is a little bit of discrimination that occurs. <laughs> um, because I will tell you, at, 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 th- at things like Big Dogs and, and any of the other major Jeep events, there is a little bit of shunning when that JL came out. Oh, yeah. And I was like, well, it's wider, it's longer, I can use it more readily. But uh, the term mall crawler comes to mind sometimes when you see them. And, and I'm like, I actually love that longer wheelbase. I love that it was wider. I even went wider when we mm-hmm. upgraded the axles after I broke the <laughs> stock axles. <laughs> um, and I will tell you, I've pretty much broken everything on the Jeep. Um Except for the engine and trans. Well, no, that's not true. I blew a head gasket last summer. Oh, it's fine. But to that point, um, not through any normal daily use, right? And so, you know, through each of the shops that it's been to, which I want to say off the top of my head, about six shops. Um, I've been through three drive shafts. Uh, I had an Adams drive shaft. I busted one out in um, Moab. Okay. And that really had to do with moving up to one tons but even though i had an adams drive shaft it wasn't the size the, properly no still too small yeah the torque was just nasty yeah. you need to go from the the 1310s to the 1350s when you get a tons yep and i'd say that's the only misstep we made on that but fortunately there's a dude out there a mechanic uh nicknamed mad max mm-hmm. um and I had seen him before. I I just happened to be present when a Jeep rolled on Spider. And so we rushed over there. Nobody got hurt. We pulled, you know, the Jeep back over with the winch. And then here comes this dude in this pickup with no tail bed, just the the crane and then toolboxes mounted, cranking ACDC. Yeah, kind of like Matt's off-road recovery style. Yeah, and he did a 180 power turn and backed <laughs> up to the Jeep. I mean, he was like, and then just backs up, and all you can hear is ACDC blaring. No doors on this thing. Oh, yeah, those guys are ripped, man. Those recovery vehicles out there, they're so cool. And he just jumps out, cigarette in his mouth like you would expect, you know, goes up, hooks up to it, Pops it up. It just starts driving away on the trail, right? Oh, yeah. Mind you, there's... Was it a dually? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I did take pictures and video all this because I was just way too fascinated by it because I'm like, I want to be that when I'm 65. Mm-hmm. I think this would be the coolest job. But that... clapped out square body and just go pull Jeeps off the trail. Yeah. I mean, if I remember, I think it was like a 65 Chevy mm-hmm. pickup. Um with all the rust and, and, you know, the different shades of primer that In have the been on it. the perfect spots. <laughs> Just makes it look beautiful. But I was like, it, it brought back a lot of high school memories. But um, I, I guess, you know, in terms of, of kind of where I was going with that is is uh, the drive shaft damage, you know, while we were out there, ended up going down to St. George. Mm-hmm. Um because I had maybe 500 miles before that thing was toast. And so he came out and we did on the site inspection because I had looked at everything. I couldn't figure out where the squeak in the world was coming from. And because the axles were so new, I was worried. It was an axle. Yeah. So then, um, yeah, we head down to St. George, uh, went over to visit uh, driveline specialists. And I pulled into the bay right, of this industrial complex. The guy got under there, measured it. He's like, go grab a sandwich and come back in a couple hours. So I was like, um, okay. So I go get a sandwich, come back. He had a brand new drive shaft for me and then also fixed the other one, which wasn't serviceable. Did you keep it as a spare? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, even Woo-hoo. even though it may be small, it'll still get you <laughs> off the trail. Yep, but I carry it. I carry it now as well. So um, he hit me back on the road in two and a half hours, custom built on the spot. Uh, just a big shout out. Huge thanks. I mean, it was one of those things where had, is that me? It's my work phone. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. What I brought it with me. So, you know, it's, it's, it's those little things. Um, 
where, you know, the, the summer before it was uh, the stock drive shafts um, out at the Imperial Sand Dunes in mm-hmm. Southern California where episode one of, or well, sorry, episode four of Star Wars was filmed, first okay. Star Wars movie. Um, I followed a Z-71 around. So I was running 37s at the time, about 12 PSI. No problem, just scooting through those sand, like I was on asphalt and having a great old time. And then here comes the Z-71 just barreling through the desert. And so I was like, all right. So, you know, we're chasing each other, falling around and probably doing about 35. And then I see him disappear, right? He goes off a sand dune and his truck disappeared, Right. Like he jumped it unintentionally. He, I, uh, yeah, it was not intentional. <laughs> so <coughs> those sand dunes are so dangerous because you, you rip up to the top. You're like, oh, it should just be a, a, a roller coming down the other side. And it's just a cliff. Well, and to this point, so I had spoken with him before we decided to, to start around. ripping. Um, and he was he was from the area, knew, knew the dunes well. And so he was fine, by the way. He knew where he was going. The truck was fine. Yeah. Okay. I followed him and there was nothing I could do. And so my instinct was to accelerate into it because I didn't want to tip over if mm-hmm. it was a big drop. And it was a big drop. It was about an eight foot drop. So we launch off it and just slam. Right. So yeah, it jarred us. No big deal. Cruised on. Didn't think too much about it. But what ultimately happened is, yeah. Bent the front axle to the point it was a smiley face. <laughs> However. So you've done a lot of trail repairs. Or not trail repairs. You've done a lot of repairs out west. Because I imagine you couldn't get that home. Or did you trailer that home? Uh, no. So um, we ended up taking it to Texas. Fixed it in Texas. Now I drove it there. <clears throat> because at the time I did not know how bent it was. I just noticed everywhere I went I was leaving a, a nice puddle. <laughs> So I got under there, I inspected it. You could see where it was coming from the joints. So we put it up on a rack um, and up near Dallas, a uh, buddy of mine uh, who basically builds engines for a living and, and works on F1 cars and things like that, was like, yeah, I'll take a look at it for you. So, yeah, we immediately could see exactly what the problem was. Um, so, you know, made the determination that it, it – it should be able to make it home, but it's it's you just got to deal with a lot of the vibration and mm-hmm. keep filling it. So um, made it home and made the decision to move up to one tons because if I'm going to keep doing this, replacing it with the same thing yeah. isn't going to work. Yeah, my my buddy, um, he's actually been on the show. He he likes to build build them like anvils. B- <laughs> build your vehicle like an anvil so you can do the worst to it and you can always get home. So even even though tons may be overkill for for most people, if you're going out doing these trips like this, if you want to guarantee that you're going to get home, the the cost of a, a set of tons is worth the the safety of being able to know you're going to make it back home every time. Well, and to put it in a little bit more perspective, um, the the stock Danas were. Um, I, I would say about 80% of the cost of a one ton yeah. at the time. Yeah. Well, not now the, the rear one was fine by the way. Yeah. yeah and cause, cause those, you said it was a Rubicon. So it's not the, it's the 44 pretty yep. much. It's the, it's got some weird part number because Jeep's weird, but it's pretty much a Dana 44. <laughs> it's a Dana 44, which back then, um, which I guess now would have been about three years ago. Yep. Um, they ran about 7,500 bucks. So I was kind of like, well, it was about 8,500 to bump up to a one ton Mm -hmm. per axle. Um, But the per axle was the, what I would say, miscalculation a little bit. (laughs) Because you said, yeah, go ahead and do it. It's only $8,500. And you're like, oh, shit. Well, but, but the advice was correct. I mean, we still had at that time about 38 trails left. Yeah, that we wanted to do. Yeah, so we we haven't dove into that yet. Um, You've done every uh, Jeep badge of honor trail, and that's not a small task. Five years, it it in I was aggressive. Yeah, which is to say, I was doing 
no less than 20 trails a summer. So I was only driving from basically June through August, Mm -hmm. um, which as you can guess, right, summer's off, got the kids. Uh, My my wife and daughters have been a part of, I want to say all but 10 trails. Which I know is a di- work. They still want to do the rest. Yeah. Um, but it's difficult, right? So I'm very fortunate. Um, uh, the, the company I work for, I can work from anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I have taken meetings from the trails. Uh, bought a set of those uh heavy machinery headphones. Yeah. That block out all the external noise, especially. Oh, so you, so you sound clear to them too. Yeah. So they just hear your voice. They don't hear. The party happening in the background at at camp? I have done 70 down the road, top down, doors off, and nobody knew. Nice. And so, yeah, well worth it. (laughs) Let's let's, let's jump back to the tons before we dive into the uh, Badge of Honor trails. So you said you had a few few trails left before you swapped tons, right? So you did, you did, you were 30 trails in when you did the ton swap? No, at the time that we did the swap, I had 38 trails left. Okay. And that was before they added the trails in 2023. So at the end of 23, they added uh, six more. Okay. Which is all good because I I like that they keep adding them. Um, But then also some trails drop off. So if Mm -hmm. they're not maintained or they don't keep them up to the the, The standard. Yeah. Um, It's an interesting process, but that's a step. I mean, that's pretty impressive that you did. You did that much traveling and you... I mean, a few drive shafts and a few axles, but you did that much traveling and didn't hurt it that bad. It didn't hurt it severely that bad. You may, I mean, maybe brake lines, maybe cut some tires or something. No but. brake lines. No, well, I did, I did pretzel a tire um, in San Antonio at Marble, uh, Marble Falls. Um, I didn't know that it came off. So I know what you're going to say. No, I, I don't run bead lockers. I haven't ever no, you don't reach need that them. point yeah i mean so the only reason i run bead locks on my xj is because i cut so many valve stems that i needed valve stem protection mm. and i found my set of bead locks for 200 dollars for a set of four wow i don't need bead locks i have them because they were so damn cheap and i was tired of cutting valve stems i bet <laughs> um so so from that perspective the the main and primary dam- yes has been axles um aside from that um one thing that i I was ecstatic about is that even though when we did the axle upgrade we were able to stick with the evo long arm just Mm -hmm. make the adjustments of course but yeah because a lot of these a lot of these axles are bolt-in that's just it's it comes from the manufacturer ready to slap into into the vehicle with the e-locker connection because that's that's what you have right And and i know it was an issue but the e-locker connection just it same wiring all you do is plug it in yeah and there there's an adapter um i want to say i believe it was the automotive that made it there there is a um adapter that's a go between that allows you to use all oem mm-hmm. buttons which is wild that's so cool that they did that it was it was kind of a big deal to me cuz the guys wanted to put in we we wanted to put in um a separate set of switches and i was like no i'd really like to aesthetically keep it as original as possible. So I'm mm. still running the original bumpers, which I have pretty much destroyed. Um, I mean, reaching- the, the, the hard rock, <laughs> the modular three piece bumpers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, a big switch. That was one of the first things I did when we got our JK is I took off that plastic garbage and I put the, the modular hard rock three piece bumper on. Well, we took the, uh, took the end caps off right away. You have to. Um, and I, I, yeah, not a fan of it, <laughs> but again, I was trying to keep it as much original mm-hmm. as possible. Um, so yeah, the 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 mistakes that I would say that happened with the um, the one ton upgrade was ended up doing springs, shocks, rims, tires, uh, and then put a big bore, a PSC big bore in hydraulic steering um, makes a huge difference. Critical critical um and i say that for a ton of reasons because one hated the electronic steering from day one um sorry g that was a terrible idea uh yeah did, well because it was constantly fighting against you mm-hmm. and even anybody that knows when that 2018 and 19 came out the 
speed wobble and constant correction. I think it was a year before they did it. I'm, I'm sure folks went out there and got the Terraflex uh, Falcon, the, the the stabilizer. Yep. Best hundred eighty dollars I ever spent. Um, instantly cleared it up. Adjustable, low, medium, hard. So that being said, um, it wasn't the axles; it was everything else. To the point that everything else cost almost as much as the axles. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, after that, with the four and a half inch lift, long arm, um, running 40s, there was nothing I couldn't handle. And that was the goal, mm-hmm. was to make sure that we could do everything now in the sense of don't go swimming by yourself. Yep. <laughs> I didn't have the luxury of always having somebody. However, I traveled with pretty much everything you could need. Communication equipment, recovery stuff. So uh, Starling phone, in addition to just about every tool um, along the way, uh, kept I had ARB twin onboard air mm-hmm. compressor, um, <clears throat> modified that and added a reserve tank so that I could run. That's cool tools along the way um kept a torch uh spare axles uh spare um shocks you name it um i will tell you (laughs) i have needed just about everything i've used uh and i've gotten out of some nasty situations but um well that that comes a lot from uh your military i I assume it comes a lot from your military experience because because it seems like the guys that have that are the most prepared learned it somewhere and they learned it for a reason somewhere is, is if you're going to go, you're going to go prepared. I think that's some, that's one of the, it's one of the slogans is go prepared and be ready to take on any thing that comes is, Oh, what I have a thing that I used to say and I can't remember it. It's a uh, hope for the best, expect the worst. Yes. That's a good one. I, I thought you were going to say failure to plan is planning to fail, right? Yep. Um. <laughs> yeah. hope, hope for the best, expect the worst. We'll have to we'll have to make a dozen shirts out of this. Um, so interesting enough, I, I was what was called a dirt sailor. Um, I was with the CBs and which is a construction battalion. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, uh, never on board ship, but always on land and in some sort of area that that yeah, the terrain was uh, ob- constant obstacles and overcoming those. Um, but to your point. Uh, when you're deploying in the middle of nowhere, you take everything you could possibly need. Uh, and I will say, at least for me, um, my, my, my wife calls it Jeep therapy, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, which is to say I'm probably happiest in the Jeep and happiest oh, when I'm out on the trails. And if there's not a challenge or somebody didn't get stuck or we had to find a way over it, it, it it's not very memorable. I mean, no. that, that's the things you remember is overcoming those obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way as, is I've this year I've been out one time a month. So I, and I put 1600 miles on my Jeep off for just off road so far this year. Granted 600 miles was in a weekend and in 24 hours in a weekend. Damn. Um, but yeah, I'm the same way is, is if, if I am find myself stressed at work, stressed at home, I'll call, call up some buddies and I'll, it, this year it's been Canaan Valley. I'll, and we'll just go somewhere. We'll we'll go out wheeling for the weekend and, and go camping and have a good time. And it's just it's just, it's just so relaxing. Is it? And it's not even. I mean, granted, it's the Jeep is the tool we use to do it. It's not even Jeep thing. It's just the being off road thing. Like I want to get a I want to get a, a dual sport because it's like the Jeep. But if the wife's not coming, <laughs> I can throw my tent and throw a backpack full, full of food, and I'm good. I can just go escape and and be out a little quicker. Be out somewhere and call up some buddies and, and we can do a dual sport adventure. And it's just, just spending that time out in the woods, just how humans were programmed is we, we were, we were, we were built in the woods. Human, human beings were built in the environment. And I, it's, it's such, it's so refreshing to be there. And it's funny you mention that because East coast versus West coast, right? We, we, I have a, a slogan on our Instagram, which is, uh, made in the East built for the West mm-hmm. because it is a West coast style crawler. And the mentality being the majority of the trails are Midwest to West. 
right? At, at least from a rock crawling perspective. Now, don't get me wrong. We've been all up and down the East Coast. Um, you, you know, we've we've hit Wind Rock and we've hit everything in uh, Georgia and Tennessee. And so um, the difference, I would say, on the East Coast with the foliage, the mountains, uh, the rocks, uh, it, it's, it's a completely different style of off-roading in, in, in my mind than what takes place in, for example, Utah, Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, Moab or St. George, which, uh, love Moab. Uh, St. George is Disneyland to me. Um, because of the fact that, you know, the one regulation they have is that you have a flag, you know, 90, mm -hmm. the top of the flag has to be 96 inches off the ground. It's right? not that high. If I remember correctly, uh, I may have to double check that, but yeah. my, my, my recollection, at least because I got pulled over for this, <laughs> 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 which, which, uh, it was understood, but, but the, it's it's completely open wild wild west out there however it is super soft right mm -hmm. you really need to know what you're doing in saint george is that saint hollow um is i want Saint george so saint george is about 120 miles um east of vegas and five hours south of moab okay uh red rock territory okay. um i'm trying to remember i think I want to say Sand Hollow is near there, but if you're familiar with Bryce and Zion, okay, yep, yep. Um, 30 and 60 minutes away. So there's so much to offer there, but uh, Rattlesnake was an incredible trail. The guys that fixed the drive shaft were like, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, nothing. What are you doing? <laughs> what, what do you <laughs> so, want to do? It was a Saturday and they're like, we're going to do the Rattlesnake, be there at seven, right? And, and it ended up being, it's the same crew that runs the Easter Jeep Safari. Okay. Oh, right? that's cool. That's a that's a good crew to get tied in with. Forty two rigs, and I was average. So in, you just you group. just casually got invited to a, a, a wheeling event with forty two rigs because they fixed your Jeep. Yeah, that's sweet. And, and well, even more so is there wasn't a single Jeep that wasn't running forties. It wasn't at mm -hmm. least four and a half. Some of the there was one that was basically a buggy. Um. So yeah, we did um, 26 river crossings. It was awesome. Um, some of them we bypassed and skipped because it was just too deep, uh, even though I still wanted to. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but spent the day with them. Just had an incredible day because that's the that was one of the few and first times I had been with that many Jeeps of that caliber, uh, which, which I think I saw this Jeep poster of, of like, the four levels of Jeeps, mm -hmm. like going from stock to lifted to bigger tires to two, completely two, two off. chassis buggy. A buddy of mine gave me a Jeep shirt that showed two Jeeps and it, it said the more you play with it, the bigger it gets. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's true though. It, and it showed those different stages. So the, the, the folks that ended up running with, um, just outstanding technical drivers. It was such a good time. Um, rolling through the desert and the, the rattlesnake if, if you were to look it up on youtube uh probably one of the most widely driven trails out there at do least. you do any of the social media stuff do you post any of your adventures to youtube or instagram or no i'm sad to say that i have about 90 hours of gopro video okay. that hasn't been dealt with um a couple years ago when we're about sort of halfway through the trails my wife was like you should really post or document this if you're gonna try to do all this yeah so then we started sub-zero on instagram um ironically someone had sub-zero so i think we're sub-zero jeep i gotta look it up i think you're sub-zero jeep there you go and um she started posting uh we picked up about I want to say 700 followers in a day nice. and it took off like wildfire. And, um, it's been really good, but then I also am not driving year round. Yeah. And so things kind of drop off. So if you gotta, if, if you want to stay up with, it, you got to bank content, you got to take extra pictures. It's, it's from doing it. I know it's so much work. It's, and it takes a lot of the enjoyment out of the actual experience to have to stop and think, oh, shit, I should document this for other people to enjoy. No, this trip's about me. I don't like 
<laughs> as, as selfish as it is, it's it's for you. Is yeah, you met someone on Instagram may enjoy it, but why do I care what they enjoy? I'm having fun doing it. I want to do it. I don't want to take time out of my day for someone else's enjoyment. It's it's selfish, but that's that's the way I look at it. Is I know as for for the dirt nerds, we're a growing brand. Yeah. If we want to, I hate to use the word succeed, but if we want to grow in today's modern era, we have to do that. It kills me so much because I am such an in the moment guy that it seems like you are too. Like it's just doing the documentation is one thing, but then you have the 90 hours of footage that you need to figure out what the hell to do with that. And then it's hours and hours and days of editing to get up something else for, to share what, I mean, you're, you're sharing what you did. You're growing the sport, but it's someone else's enjoyment. Well, you know, it's, it's, funny. it's taking time away from you and your enjoyment. It is. And, and you're a hundred percent right. I mean, in the selfishness fashion of I'm doing it cause I want to do it. Um, the family kind of comes up now to be fair. My daughter is now 16 from the time she was 11, which she was about five, two at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, she's been driving and off-roading since she was 11. Right. And, and that was what, that was a big deal for me at least because, um, I wanted her to have no fear, but also know how to address and deal with obstacles and things like that. What's funny is we reach around to, you know, the age of 15 when, most kids in Virginia are going through driver's ed and learning all of that. Um, The transition to the street was interesting because she was used to having to pick her line and her own path. And so she still, even though she had been off-roading and driven some of the toughest trails in our list, um, yes, you teach along the way, stop here, pay attention, look left, look right. She still had to go through driver's ed just like everyone else, right? Um, but that being said, to your point, yes, the pictures, the video, all of it that I took and posted, the things I did post were just the things that I liked and thought were cool. Um, and it it wasn't with the intention of trying to make money or get Mm -hmm. sponsors or do that thing. I was really just sharing and yeah, yeah, looking to inspire. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. There's, there's two different ways to look at it is there's people that, that try and monetize the sport. And there's people that try and share and grow the sport. Is I'm I'm very much for the sharing and growing the sport as mu- as much as it would be nice to monetize. I'm not. That's not what I'm here for. It's not what. That's not what we're here for. We're here to to share and grow it and and help other people discover the joy of what we do. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, that would be really cool to one day reach that point. But my job would not really, at least at the moment. I think I would no, have to mine retire. Either. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, I'm, I, I'm I, took, a, I took today, I took this morning off work. And my boss is like, you're doing what? And I'm like, I'm just going to go record a podcast with a buddy. So it's funny you say that. I did the same thing. And, and it's it, it, the support of the company I work for. It's funny. When I first started with them, uh, which was in 2020, uh, four years ago, I let them know what I was doing. And I said, hey, you know, it's really important to me that I have the ability to travel and continue to work. Because I already worked from home. Mm-hmm. So what difference does it make where, where the, I am? Where the home is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they were like, no problem. Um, you know, as long as everything gets done and, and there's no impact, which there wasn't. Uh, so I reached a point where the last two summers, so it's worth noting that three, the last three summers in a row, I've gone across the country and back. The paths I took were different for each one. And so I basically hit all the trails lower half with some in California and came back. Then I went across the middle and came back. And then I went Mm -hmm. across upper United States. Um, But to the point that I was moving at a pace where I was hitting a state every other day. And And wheeling in between, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wheeling, working, driving. It was nonstop. And it was aggressive. Uh, <laughs> I would say looking back, I, I had I had a couple schools of thought. It takes a lot of time, energy. Um, I think the costs back then were a little lower than they are today in terms of gas. Things like, you, you know, finding family and friends to stay with while you're mm-hmm. doing it. Whether you're camping, there were hotels in there. And then there, there was also uh, coordinating things in such a way that it wasn't 
all about the trails. And I know that's an instant perception. I, I explained to my coworkers that it's really the journey. Yeah. Not the destination. And each town that we stopped to visit in, there was always something to do. And, and that's really the things that I would say the family and, and, and I remember is going to these different places, the time we spent there, because hitting the trails did get a little monotonous, yeah. right? And we conquered them and they were done and it was recorded and blah, blah, blah. But uh, some trails only took a couple hours where it took may have taken eight hours to get there. And then you stop, visit the town, check out the local culture, do do whatever is in that area. And then either the next morning or sometimes that evening we would hit the trail. Mm-hmm. Um, knock them out and then move to the next one. Yeah, it's, um, so with the connections I've made over this year and last year, um, Backroads, Backroads of Appalachia, they really love to that, – that's their whole mission is to, to grow motorsports in their states. I think they're – Tennessee, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky. Um, and with that, they they partner with, I don't know if they're partners with, but when we were out last time, we were with uh, Monforce Towns, Mon- Monongahela Forest Towns. So it's, it's a partnership to bring tourism to that area. And really the best part is going out, yeah, I'm out to wheel, but we ended up in the best restaurant I've ever been into in my entire life in the back backwoods of West Virginia. And it, we just stumbled across it because we were exploring and, and w- without the exploration, you don't find these things. Um, what inspired you to do the, all of the Jeep badge of honor trails? Oh man, that was an accident. <laughs> um, so we, we did the uh, let's jump on Facebook and find all the the Jeep groups and meet yeah. up like Northern Vir- Nova Jeepers, Central Virginia Jeep, y- you name it, uh, Infidels, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, off road militia. A couple hours south yeah. of here, yeah, their page got taken down, then put back up, then taken down. Now, now they're ORM. Well, Butch is a good guy. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so I, I did enjoy that. Uh, that timeline of off-road militia, their page got removed because it had the word militia in it. Now they're ORM. I think that got removed one time and now they're ORM again. But it, it was just it was just fun watching all that happen because it, it happened with the political time frame of of COVID is <laughs> off-road militia to ORM to, to, the, well, to the bouncing around. They are a good group. I've never wheeled with them, but I do enjoy their page. Well, so the JL is the only Goshen off-road trail rated JL. Okay. Which is to say they, they have uh, the Goshen range um, and you, it's brush just, it, it's in the process, right? So a few years ago they were just building the trails, but we, I mean, there were saplings and we were going through it and you just need to be prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's about three hours south of, uh, we'll say south of DC. Um, but long story short, uh, that crew was one of the first we ran with, and they kind of introduced us to other groups. It, it, it was to the point where we joined all of them because somebody was doing something every weekend. Yeah. And traditionally, at least at that time, you didn't have every group trying to do something on the same weekend. So the beauty was maybe you can't, maybe you can't go out and hit a trail this weekend, but next weekend, but. Everybody was doing something at some, that there was always something to do. So we jumped in on the Peters Mill mm-hmm. badge run. And so got out there. Uh, I want to say, I think that was with the Nova Jeepers. Um, we had, at least at that time, one of the largest recorded uh, badge runs where there were. 86 jeeps they Oof. did the whole drone flyover which i've got i've got yeah. those photos we're just one big long snake for the whole thing pretty much yes 86 jeeps that's a lot of jeeps well they nobody expected that that many people were going to show up mm-hmm. for this um but got out there and i knew it was a badge run but what i didn't know or understand it was about the badge of honor i wasn't really aware of it and the guy's like yeah just download the app so I was like, oh, this is cool uh, because we're not from Virginia. I'd only been here a couple years at that time and was still learning it. Mm-hmm. 
So I was like, okay, well, this is great. I mean, we've done way more than the Badge of Honor trails. Uh, anytime we did uh, a, a BOH trail, we were hitting everything in the local area, too. What's so, a BOH trail? Badge of Honor. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, we we did all the ones in, in, in what I would say was in about five hours. So um, went to we, we've always gone to visit family because we're we're originally from Texas. So visit folks that I've served with or, or different areas going from Virginia down to Texas and back. Um, we like to do summer drives and trips. Uh, so switch that over to say, hey, why don't we hit some of these trails on the way? And we'll just stop and we'll have a good time and off road. So, you know, we got about a third of the way through and I was like, I want to try to do all of these. Uh, and we began, you know, the next year, that first trek of going across the country and back. Um, so you really just use this as a jumping off point. You're like, hey, I don't know much about this off roading thing. You got with the Nova Jeepers, you hit Peter's Mill. You're like, oh, wow, this is cool. And this network of trails exists. It seems like you quickly outgrew the badge of honor thing. You're like, oh, I know how to explore my own and do my own thing. But since we're here, might as well hit it just for fun. And in the spirit of the badge of honor is is you really used it as your introduction into off-roading. Oh, 100%. 100%. That's, that's so cool. Um, I wonder if they – have you taught – have you – been in contact with the badge of honor guys do they know your story not yet um well they will yeah i meant i meant to grab for you because all of them are just in a big box right now um i have an idea for a plank i want to make that's going to go in the back door because oddly enough the badges fit perfectly into the slots on mm -hmm. the tailgate so um anyway i do have uh a desire to reach out to them and let them know. Cause I am very curious. Cause from what I can tell, I'm the first JL to finish them. Um, I do know that there's a couple folks hot behind me. Uh, but what, what's easily documentable is the dates. Yeah. <laughs> um, probably one of my favorite things. I'm a data guy. So one of the coolest things I, I like about that badge of honor trail is, is, is tying it to the VIN It's the same Jeep, same engine, same transmission, same vehicle with some mods. Yeah. Right. Through time because of the trails you you've had to upgrade because you did the trails and it, and I think they're all designed for the Rubicon platform. Like you can yeah. take a stock Jeep through all of them, but if you're going to do all of them, you're going to find issues with that stock Jeep and you're going to have to upgrade. So I, I have, I will Unless you jump it over a sand dune, then that's not a, <laughs> that's not a badge of honor issue. Mm, yeah. Um, we have done, yes, I have taken it, uh, through, for example, Elephant Hill has some nice side trails on the, on the back side of it. And one of my favorite runs was cruising through there about 40 miles an hour, um, just barreling through the desert and it's just awesome mm -hmm. um i did post a video on that one probably 20 seconds but uh i think i used cakes uh going the distance as the music nice. for it but did that you beginning know the, you know the story of that song no oh <laughs> it's funny it seems like a racing song if you listen to it it's about masturbation <laughs> oh jesus <laughs> And, and go back and listen to it. You're like, holy shit. That is 100% right. Oh, everything. It explains everything. All alone in his time of need. So <laughs> yeah. what was cool I don't is, know where I learned that, but I definitely learned the fact. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm that's gonna, wild. I'm going to say I will never forget that fact now. And ha having that been a favorite song for probably 30 oh, plus years. Oh, I love years, that song. I I. What yeah, that song 18? came out nine in the '90s, early 2000s. It had to be '93, '94 because yeah. I was out of high school at that time, so somewhere in there. But that beginning where it's like, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, right? Yeah. So it was a gradual acceleration, and what's funny is, um, my cell phone I mount inside. I mount the GoPro on the front bumper, and ironically, almost. Everything that's posted on Instagram is coming from my phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Because it's so much easier. And the video, what's funny is the phone doesn't have the stabilization technology that the GoPro does. Mm -hmm. right? They're getting good. They're getting really good with the stabilization technology, but it's not quite GoPro. 
but I like it. Oh, because, the little bit of shakiness? Yes, because it shows you in a way that the GoPro really doesn't. Because on the GoPro, you just see the top of the Jeep turning mm-hmm. left and right. But with, oh, because it's stabilized to the horizon, not to the vehicle. Correct. Whereas the phone is just going, right? Um, but anyway, that that's probably one of the most liked videos that I posted. And I think it... It really had more to do with the terrain, the atmosphere, the speed. Um, but you you could not have done what I was doing in a stock Jeep. No. It would have demolished it. And, and there are areas where I'm spotting those potholes. And no, I'm not trying to break anything. I mean, I'm careful. Uh, I want to go home. <laughs> uh, so, so that's something I do tell folks is, is that, yes, I don't take unnecessary risks in, in that way. Um, I have been in a handful of situations where, uh, I thought I was going to die. Um, like, like, uh, there, there was a trail in Moab. Um, it, it's near spider. I'd have to look, I meant to have my phone with me. Uh, but basically it's got a point, um, where there's a sign that says no left turns, which, which is basically about a 200 foot drop. Yeah. Um, but it it is it is so technical in the way that you have to hug the wall and get down it or you're gonna roll right um but it got into a situation where i couldn't go backwards right it, it this was a must go forwards uh but forwards was also no sketchy return. as hell it was um so i went and took my phone put it up in a tree <laughs> because at the time, I was like, well, I want someone to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair. So, yeah. So, I, I got through it first try. And, and you know, if you w- I want someone to know what happened, let's document this so they at least know what happened to my body. This was my mindset. I mean, I had been on the trails for about six hours at this time. Just, you know. You're pretty exhausted because those are slow trails, too. So, you're you're working for six hours. You're You're mentally and physically exhausted after that. That you, 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 yes, you bring up a good point. Um, I also try to explain to folks you're moving at less than a mile an hour, right? Mm-hmm. One to two miles an hour, crawling, backing up, adjusting, hitting a different angle. It's not always perfect the first time, um, how you're grabbing and pulling. And so spotter or no spotter, it's still a lot of work, right? So I come off it and I drive straight up to the tree and I pull it off. And looking back at the video, you can see the look on my face where I was just like, thank God. (laughs) I was like, well, would like to have known that before going through. Because to be fair, yes, I do research each trail before I go on it. Almost every trail has a video. Somebody somewhere has done a video on these. So I do watch them. And That's the nice thing about YouTube is is for our Moab trip, we leave in two weeks to go to Moab. For our our Moab trip, Tom did all the planning. He watched all the YouTube videos. We're driving... Three Jeeps across country were trailing another. He's like, we will be able to do these trails with skilled driving and be able to drive everything home. Yes. Because we have the the ability to watch those videos and do our research that way. Yeah. I, I mean, so I saved um, the Doozy Ursham for last. Um, 33 miles, 34, depending on Line which choice. route you take. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the expectation, at least, and, and most folks do it in about three days, do about 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, driving. Or eight to 10. And then, you know, it's got so many beautiful lakes along. The, it's just gorgeous. But you are not getting through there. I mean, you, you, you need lockers. You need four-wheel drive. You need a winch. There's one point where I was winching every 80 feet. Um, and, and that was in my rig. Mm-hmm. Right. It it was just well, because it was rainy and slippery. And uh, for, unfortunately, the day that I started, it started pouring down. Where's this trail at? Uh, California. California. So um, it's just outside of uh, not Tahoe. What's the uh, or it might be Tahoe. I'm trying to remember. Um, it might be Tahoe. What Tahoe's in not Tahoe. Uh, dang it. I'd know it if you said it. Um, do you want to pause for a second? Sure. Okay, so back to the Doozy Ursham, Fresno, California, um, just outside. Uh, it's about 
30 miles as the crow flies, um, but given the uphill climb uh, speed limits and things like that, and depending on what route you take to get there, that's a good hour drive. Um, so I brought camping gear, food. There is no help out there. There are no gas stations. Um, there's a, I did come across a couple um uh, outhouses slash porta potties. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so I hit the trail, pouring down raining. You know, you, you come across this. Which is weird for that part of California. It, it almost never rains out there. Huge rock. Well, the week after I left, it snowed. So I it's only open uh, a couple months out of the year. And it has a lot to do with weather, terrain, and you you get stuck or you get screwed out there. It's going to be a while before you get help. Uh, but that being said, I saved it for last. This was to me the ultimate. I will tell you, it was the it is the toughest trail I've been on. Pritchett Canyon in Moab is tough as nails. Um, I think that's a nine on a scale of ten. Yeah. Um, the first time I tried it, I did Pritchett halfway uh, and couldn't go any further because I just didn't have the grab, the reach, the height. Everything was wrong about the rig at the time to do that trail. Um, but I was aggressive and thought I could do it. <laughs> and you probably could have made it through the end. I don't know if you would have been in one piece mechanically, but you probably could have made it to the end if you made it halfway. Yeah, I, well, I... It's, I, it's just been a lot of mechanical regret after that. Uh, yes, and I have been down mechanical regret alley. Um, <laughs> it, it was one of those where, no, I was unwilling to risk... The yeah. damage. Uh, I actually have a sweet video where I had to back up a couple of the drops and basically stairs and obstacles where it was a three foot drop. Mm -hmm. Did those backwards, um, which I was proud of. Uh, and I do have that on video because I was like, we're going to video this because I had. <laughs> if I'm it, dying, someone's going to know. Well, this was a no. This was another one of those no choice situations because there was no way. There was no way to turn around. Mm -hmm. I just had to go backwards. Yeah, it's not the East Coast. You can't just roll up another fifteen feet, find a nice tree to run over, and turn around. But but the doozy. Um, what ended up happening um, is I, I went in. Um, I did get about a third of the way through day one. Uh, stopped raining. Cooked my meal. It was just me. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There were six other Jeeps as well. Mm -hmm. but So you were in a little group? Sort of. I wasn't with them, but I found a group to jump into. Okay. So they just happened. Well, that's the nice thing about the offer community is they were probably more than welcome to more, more than willing to, to welcome you in. So there's a group dedicated to the doozy on um, Facebook, right? And there's posts between who's doing what and when. And it opened a month later than it normally would have. Uh, in Probably because of weather. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so from doing constant, you know, checks on weather and then when is it going to open? Uh, they also had a lot of road construction. Not that that impacted the trail itself. It just really slowed things down getting there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when you're down to one lane and everybody's trying to get up there. But that being said, the next morning, um, got up about 6 a.m., wanted to get a start. We're all going to the same place. Uh, so I told the crew, I'm, I'm going to head on. So the markers are easy to follow. Uh, trail is tough as nails. I mean, it's a beast. I, I do think you could do it on 35s uh, going really slow. Yeah. Um, I moved quickly. <laughs> well, it's the nice thing about being built like an anvil is you have the ability to move a little quicker and get things done a little faster. When you're on a small tire, it makes things a little more technical. Well, so I got, um, I, I got up to marker 24. So I was about 24 miles in by the end of day two. Um, to the point that I was like, you know, I think I could finish this today. Um, so kept moving. I hit mile 30 mm -hmm. and lost power steering. Oof. Did not know that at some point along the way, the ram got bent, um, leaking fluid. Uh, and then you hear. I remember hearing the story of the shop. Oh, man. 
yeah. So power steering pump goes. Um, I'm deflated to 12 because I don't really drop below 12. Mm-hmm. But there were some guys that were like, why didn't you just inflate the front tires? Uh, you know, that would have been easier to steer. Sure, it would have if I wasn't crawling back out. Yeah. If you still, if, if you were getting to pavement, but you still had big things to go over and, and high pressure and big things do not go well together. The, la- the last three miles were just ridiculously difficult. It took roughly three and a half hours to do the last three. Um, my arms were exhausted, elbows, wrists, everything was sore as hell. I was making cuts through there where you needed to make like a hard 90 left and then back right. I was going straight. Yeah. Right. Which was way worse obstacle wise than trying to follow the path. So I ran into the situation where I was like, okay, um, I can't take the regular route because I really can't steer. I I can steer okay enough with speed. Yeah. But at a dead stop, you're trying to move 40 is at so 100 pounds of tire with the weight of the vehicle on them. Yeah, but I needed the ability to still crawl. I'm still going over boulders and huge rocks and, you know, yeah, finding a path out. So I got out, um, hit the end, inflated the tires, uh, kept it at roughly 15 miles an hour. And anything. you weren't done yet. You still have to find a shop. Still had to go back to Fresno. Yeah. Um, so anything above 15, death wobble, not speed wobble, because it... it the forties are unforgiving. Mm -hmm. Right. So I figured out that that's what I was going to have to do. So two hours to get back or go 30 miles. (laughs) Um, just happened to because I was staying near the airport because that was the closest hotel to the area. Um, there was a shop a mile down the road. So dropped it off with them. Uh, I had to catch a flight for work, came back to Virginia hung out here for the week, went back. Um, they repaired everything, got in it, and then drove around Death Valley and went back to Moab and continued off-roading. Wild. <laughs> it was a, it was awesome. And they, they looked at me when I came in, and they were like, can't wait to see what's wrong with this Jeep. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it took great care of me um, and, and, you know, gave some additional advice. Um, there were some critical things that I would like to have known that I, I really didn't occur to me, but I couldn't have done anyway because I didn't have uh, the caps. Could have capped off the lines. Okay. Once, but by the time that I knew that the RAM was damaged and that everything had completely drained out, it, it was, was too late. It was too late anyway. But down the road, um, that actually came in handy as I was doing the last two trails. So do you carry a spare ram now just in I, case you've been I one? I carry a spare ram and I also carry two uh, end caps. To, to, I really now I should The carry rams four. actually aren't. I have a ram. I just haven't put it on my Cherokee yet. They're actually not that expensive. It's the the work that goes around the ram. It's it's the plumbing. It's the tap in the box. It's I mean, for you, it's a little harder because it's a JL. So it's a whole new steering system. But for like a hydro assist ram for a, a TJ xj z like anything older it's just tapping the box and running the lines i mean the, i think you get the kit for a few hundred bucks yeah it's uh, uh so there's a six and an eight for the big bore on the mm-hmm. um it might be eight and a half but uh i keep the six um with me which is sitting in the back but what i will say is um when you don't know those things are happening and occur mm-hmm. and by the time you find out, right. Um, it's, it's not that I would say it was a too late situation, but I think there are things that we could have done to minimize and save, for example, um, the, the, uh, power steering pump. Um, so ended up replacing those two items, got back on the road. Uh, but a month ago we finished the last two trails up at anthracite. Um, since they were close to home, mm-hmm. right? it's an amazing park. I love Anthracite. Oh man, that's my Disney World. If yeah. if 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 St. George is Disneyland, right? Yeah. <laughs> That'll be my Disney World. But um, I, I mean, I pinched a hydraulic line coming off the pump that 
just nicked a uh, one of those plastic clip spots that is mm-hmm. comes from uh, the factory. It's it's on the frame, and it just nicked it, right? And those are three hundred psi lines, right? So once it was compromised, right, it shot everywhere, but I didn't know it. But I instantly started to feel a jerkiness, so I immediately stopped. And I I had just happened to finish the last two, so we pulled off in the staging area right mm-hmm. there. Um, get out. I can see it on the ground immediately. And I was like, oh man. So, you know, attempted to do kind of a repair right there on the spot, wrap it, but in <clears throat> realizing that that wasn't going to do that much good, um, went ahead and capped it off. Yeah. Right. I was like, okay. And believe it or not, I drove fine. Um, I actually, I, I was like, I could probably drive this home like this. Ram wasn't damaged, just hydraulic line got nicked. Um, that sprayed all over the belt, which the belt came off. Mm-hmm. Didn't know it. <laughs> uh, so you as weren't we, charging. You didn't have. You also wouldn't have had the power steering because the 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 belt was gone, not to drive anything. Well, because I wasn't paying attention to the not having power steering because I already knew that I didn't have power steering. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, cooling issues started first. Yep. Then alternator. But almost simultaneously. And I was like, hmm. Because for those that don't know, the JL fans have a very loose connection where the power lines connect to the fan on that plug. So I keep those things zip tied. That is a nasty lesson learned <laughs> in the middle of New Mexico. But uh, yeah, so. That's a good idea. Zip tie. If, you, if you're taking something apart and you're putting it back together, make sure you zip tie the connections. That way, you know it's not going to come apart. Well, I went through. I'm going to say six dealerships in that cross country trek until I, I took everything apart. I, I mean, I was search, I was going through everything because at that time this was post supply chain where a new fan was six to 12 months. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, then we have to fix this one. Well, then I put it back together and I moved something. I noticed the fan shut off and then I squeezed the plug in the, fan. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> So just zip tied it. Never had a problem with the fan again. So does a lot of your um, mechanical knowledge come from being a CB, or did, were you messing with stuff your whole life, messing with cars and stuff your whole life? That would come from my dad, and uh, we'll call it combination of high school years. Uh, did did uh, auto mechanics in high school, okay. so Vica, uh, vocational industrial careers of America. I think Virginia calls it DECA. Um, but basically, yeah, we had an auto shop. We did everything. We did body repair, maintenance, tires, mountain balance. We rebuilt engines, transmissions. Um, but this was the nineties and high school back then is a lot different. (laughs) It is a lot different. (laughs) Um, so yeah, it, it, from, from the, the CB perspective, no, um, what I did in the bees is I was a radio man and handled, SATCOM, HF, VHF, UHF, um, and then all the networks. But I also convinced those guys to take the governor off of my Humvee. Um, Hell yeah, brother. Well, I mean, like, I didn't run a hardened Humvee. I wanted speed Mm -hmm. uh, because I had seen what IEDs were doing to Humvees, and I was like, if I get hit with an IED, it's over anyway. I mean, the odds of survival. So I just, I wanted speed. Even being armored up, yeah. Yeah, um, and it was a choice. So uh, typically when I was making desert runs or hauling ass from point to point, it was to load crypto uh, and make sure that the vehicles out there had all the right um, basically frequencies and and, uh, were dialed in. So I needed to be able to get there fast, and that's what I asked for, and that's what they gave me. Um, Loved it. I mean, I don't think you could drive those on the street, but (laughs) farm vehicles, right? Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, I I would tell you that going back, if I had to do it again, I would probably do things a little differently. Um, I started with a Rubicon because I wanted as much 
from the factory ready to go as possible. And I do believe, and I have seen Rubicons on the Rubicon Mm -hmm. going extremely slow, extremely careful. And to the point that I would just pass them, right? Like you would on the highway. If there's that little old guy who can't see and is doing 30 and a 60, I'm doing 60, (laughs) um, not, not miles per hour, but in, in relation. So, yeah, between driver level and, and equipment level, you're you're able to bypass those stock vehicles. But they can do it. They can do it, yeah. It, it is. I, I remember as you enter the Rubicon, there's this little rock garden. And I'm going through there just juggle, 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 juggle. And then I, I saw this Rubicon coming because I stopped to take a picture of Marker 1 and this, that, and the other. And this guy was just slow crawling the rock garden. I was like, dude, you're in for... A rough ride. <laughs> um, but the Rubicon, like the Doozy, uh, has a lot of great lakes, great camping spots. I mean, my my one regret is I was short on time, and I really didn't have the luxury of camping. I did the Rubicon straight. So 18 How many miles hours. Is the Rubicon? Uh, I want to if, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it's 22. Um, I will tell you that the toughest trail in my opinion on the, on the Rubicon was one of the average trails on the doozy. Okay. Right? The doozy is a freaking beast. Um, and I love every bit of it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of what I would say you would hope for. I, I, I'm sure there are other trails across the country that I'm not aware of that are tough, that are not badge rated, mm-hmm. but as badge rated trails go, it is the hardest one. Yeah. In a, in a different way from Pritchett Canyon. I mean, Pritchett Canyon is is to me the toughest trail in Moab, um, where you you need a, a much bigger rig. Uh, but the doozy, you know, I saw pickup trucks, I saw you know, uh, lots of different types of vehicles going through there, but they're built for it, mm-hmm. right? It's not like somebody tried to go out there in an '86, you know, Chevy. <laughs> um, they're going out there in rigs. Yeah, something built for it. Absolutely. So we finished up a month ago. With um, all the trails. With all the trails. Uh, pinched that line. Um, and oh, since damn. then, you know, somebody asked me, hey, well, what are you going to do now? Right. I said, I'm going to do my favorite trails. Yeah. I'm not going to try to do this again. Um, I'm glad that I did it. And I'm, I'm glad that I was able to do it at a time when prices and gas and parts wasn't where we are now and where I think we're going with inflation and things like that. But time, energy, scheduling, coordination, I mean, it's a lot. Everything came together. Uh, and I'm not positive I could do this going forward. Um, in, in other words, it it's so much planning that goes into it. So, you know, I created all these spreadsheets with dates and times and you're talking about scheduling 90 days of traveling and trails and stopping and meeting and visiting and then work in the middle. Yeah. Do you use a start? Do you have a Starlink on the, on the Jeep that you use to, to communicate remotely? Uh, only during those months. Okay. So I don't have like an annual subscription. I just, you just have a, have a panel that you set up for those months. Yep. Um, it was cheaper that way. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. We, we use one at home and it's the best thing. I love my Starlink. I'll, I would love to travel with it. It's it really revolu- revolutionizes. Yeah, that's the right word. Revolutionizes being off the grid but on the grid. Is is when it comes to these desert races. I'm watching the the Nor 1000 right now, and there's guys live streaming from the Baja, from the middle of the Baja Peninsula. They're live streaming <laughs> while they're racing from the race car. It's 70, 80 miles an hour Damn. with with a Starlink. That's awesome. Oh, you need to get into racing, man. You, I feel like you would love racing, offered racing. Well, I didn't. It's going to be dangerous for you if you get into it. I, yeah. I, I didn't add that until the last year. So the first couple years, I was always so close to everything. Um, my phone carrier was able to do me just fine. Yeah. Um, but then I reached, I did reach a couple areas where I had no signal. Mm-hmm. Um, Those are the best areas. Those are my favorite. So don't get me wrong. CBs, radios, I, I mean, um, I've got a setup that, that will go, you know, roughly 50 miles. Um, 
with the right location and if I have the right antenna up there. <laughs> um, but traditionally, because I will tell you, I probably did 60% of the trails I did as a single vehicle, um, where the rest were with somebody or as a part of a group. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, weighted, calculated, um, not situations that if I did get completely disabled that I couldn't uh, walk a couple miles back yeah. to wherever I needed to. Well, and being a, being a comms junkie, as for a career, I'm sure you had all the comms in the Jeep to, to be able to reach someone if you needed it. I did three. There's three sets in there, <laughs> so um, yeah, I I had redundancy upon redundancy. But um, that being said, I, I mean, yeah, I kind of carry two of everything. Um, so you know, now that they're done, um, I do have favorites like this. I've been to Moab five times. Mm -hmm. um, Elephant you, you want, Hill. You want to go in a few weeks? I wish I could, uh, but I we won't talk about that. <laughs> um, but Elephant Hill. The first time I did it, I did it at night and I did a straight run, um, loved it. One of my favorite videos is on there. When I went through the devil's kitchen, uh, I did it in a single pass. So, you know, the, the width of that is, is about 68 inches and I am 74 with the forties and the mm -hmm. axles. So, um, I went through it sideways where my, uh, whatever you call that on the, on the top side of the body of the vehicle, yeah. um, where the door frame is, was inches from the wall. Um, no guide straight through popped just, out just the other praying side and being a good driver. Um, I would say, I think being dark was a benefit. You couldn't see what was going on around you. Well, I could, I could see everything happening in front of me. Right. I went back through a year later and did it in the daytime which it's like the Flintstones out there. I love it. I, I If you do it, get out there. Get out there early in the morning around 7 a.m. Um, it's about 70 minutes uh, or, or roughly 70 miles from Moab itself. Mm -hmm. um, you can get out there in about an hour 15. It's highway miles all the way out there. But go in the morning before all the groups get out there. So I went out there at 7. I was done by 10. Did nice. everything. Had a great old time. Uh, enough that I went back to Moab and then did top of the world again in the same day, which was a 12 hour day. <laughs> but, um, my favorite trails, which I, I have plenty of them, uh, are the ones that I would like to go do again and spend more time and, and take the time. There are lots of trails that I would never do again. Mm -hmm. Uh, did I did it just to do it so that we could check it off the box? Uh, but then there are those trails that were just so much fun, like, like down in North Carolina, um, uh, Dickie Bell. Okay. Right. Yeah. I've heard of that one. Um, done that one a few times, but I've, I've been out there when there's a hundred people waiting in line. Right. And, That's the and, worst part of it is waiting in line to do trails. Yeah. And, and so there was one point that, you know, we were down there for an event and I popped off and headed out there and I was like, well, we'll go spend a couple hours. I spent a couple hours in line and, and ran out of time. And I was like, people were getting stuck and, you know, everyday vehicles trying to do some of these things that just couldn't get up there. And so I left, but then came back a couple months later off season because mm -hmm. it's open year round. Nobody was there. And for the two hours that I was there, I did everything twice. Right. I just had a great, there wasn't a single Jeep out there. There were no ATVs or, you know, dirt bikes or anything. It was just. Just you. It was like I had it to myself for the day and I made every use of it. I had a good time. I stopped and I was filming, you know, I was setting cameras up and doing complete shots from every angle to the point that I was going to splice it all back together, you know, like. like Video a, editor style and professional YouTuber. Didn't do it, but, <laughs> but it was it was a blast. Right. And, and I texted my wife after and, and sent her some of the pics and videos and she's like, Holy cow, how many Jeeps were out there? I was like, none. Um, and it was great. Yeah. I was like, yeah. So that was August, by the way. Yeah, we August. did. We did Canaan loop, which if you go in the summer, Canaan loop is packed. Oh. Um, we did Canaan loop twice over the winter months. There was not a single other vehicle on the trail. No. It was beautiful it was the best and then we did canyon rim road which connect is is you got to go through davis west virginia then canyon rim road is right there 
also super popular trail hit it in the winter no one's there it's so nice if, you, if you're willing to not even willing if yeah, cold weather camping not even cold weather camping just go when other people are out there it's just it's just so much more availability to to run these trails and have more more fun doing it well i, I don't remember the one that's over there by devil's backbone um, oh uh ball uh, mountain yes ball mountain jeep trail so that was one of the first ones we did um back in I, wanted to, I wanted to do that this summer and you, you know you come out the end you've got the brewery you got camping and then my favorite was the signs there's there's a sign that has a picture of a jeep and it's like jeeps only mm-hmm. but it's a warning to trucks and you see these trucks with these long beds or or even just trucks in general that cannot make it through there um and so each time i go up there there's always one who gets in a predicament and you know going backwards on bald mountain is is an issue for a truck (laughs) but that's another one of those that i would say is is one of the favorites great time great experience it's tight i mean Mm -hmm. almost all the scratches on my jeep started there um but then you can come out at the end you know grab a beer camp out have a good time and if you want go back hit the well don't hit the trail after drinking, but yep. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so what, what's what's next? Uh, next is basically, I have a feeling we may actually take this summer off. Um, from wheeling? Sp- well, no, just from going across the country. Okay. Back. Okay. Uh, have you been up to like Maine in that area? I heard that's amazing. New Hampshire is pretty awesome too. Um, there's, so, there's only one badge trail up there, but uh, there's so many other trails. And I guess that... That would be in in the sense of what's next. Um, we've been doing as many non badge rated mm-hmm. trails. So whether you use all trails or any of the other apps, uh, we yeah, all trails on X guy is kind of hard. It's a little bit harder, but it's there. But yeah, there's, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of apps that, that can help you get out and explore. And on top of that, there's resources too, like, like the BDR you have the, have the BDR as a resource you have, um, backroads, backroads of Appalachia is starting to post more off-road trails mm. in in that Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia area. Um, I've got a bunch if you need some. Yeah, no. So Gaia, I like because it works with Android app and um, mm-hmm. um, Android Auto and Android Auto. Sorry. Uh, and then what's the Apple version of that? Um, Apple CarPlay. CarPlay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, so that being said, um, the ability to use some of those apps in that mode. So yeah, makes a uh, huge difference. I do download the trails and the waypoints and keep all those handy because when you're out there and there's no signal, having them ahead of time helps. Mm -hmm. But from a what's next perspective, um, it is spending more time on the East coast, trying to reconnect with everybody over here because I've been so what I would say is dedicated to, everywhere else but here um when we started out right we didn't start out with badge trails we started out with all the local trails and what was available and like going up to flagpole for example in Mm -hmm. harrisonburg and um we were doing anything and everything we could local but i don't it's been three years since i've been the flagpole yeah um i had a ton of fun out there Um, There's, there's some good there's a lot of good trails around that area is that that whole corridor is beautiful. <clears throat> so, um, the, the the one thing I would tell you is is if I had to do it all over again, I would start. I would have started with a sport. I wouldn't have started with a Rubicon. Mm-hmm. Um, Build the, what you want, opposed to being given what you what you think you need. Yeah, but so so for the entry level of where you started back in 2019 is you didn't know what you wanted. The Rubicon was perfect because you learned what you what you wanted and what you needed based on the capability of the most capable vehicle you could buy. You, you kind of hit the hammer on the head. I did everything we could do to the maximum capability that the Rubicon could do until I couldn't anymore, which either was based on, um, clearance, right? Tires, uh, you name it to to the point that from a flex perspective, Mm -hmm. right? So that's a good, I like that. The flex perspective. That'd be a good name for a podcast. Ooh, the flex perspective. I like it. it. To the point that, you know, 
because of the things that I was trying to do, yes, everybody gave a lot of advice and was like, you should really lift it. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna, mm-hmm. um, as soon as I have the money. Right. Uh, so then, you know, once it was lifted and then tired and everything else that comes with it. Yeah. But you did, you did it right because you did your modifications based off of need, not based off of what you think looks cool. Yeah. Is you said, Hey, I did this. It didn't work. I need to do this modification to make it work. That's a good way to look at it. Um, well, I, it's that's, more, I did this, broke this. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So, but, but you, you made your modifications based off of your necessity. And so going into it, I a hundred percent think what you did was the right way to do it. I know it's coming from a 29 year old telling you, telling you how to build a Jeep, but if you're getting into the sport, absolutely buy the Rubicon. If you are into the sport, you're looking to build your next vehicle, buy the base model and build what you need opposed to paying that extra $30,000 on the sticker price. You can spend that $30,000 and go directly to tons and forties and long arms and everything else. You're still $60,000 into a vehicle, but now you're $60,000 into a, the best vehicle you can get for $60,000. And I, I know it may him come with hopefully not a loan or credit card debt, but <laughs> probably a loan and credit card Both. debt. Yeah. <laughs> While also having a car loan. But if you're doing, doing the things you want to, if you know what you want to do and you want to build a vehicle for that, you definitely buy the base base model. So the advice, maybe the next level up to get heated seats and heated leather seats. <laughs> so, the the advice that you gave just gave is 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 really on par with a, what a couple folks told me um, because like I said I, I drove it for about eighteen months before we lifted right mm-hmm. and I had this progressive approach which I would say is what I could afford to do over time making all these changes and someone kind of pointed out to me that if you're if if this is your end goal of what you want your Jeep to be when it's done. The advice from, from this individual was to do it all at once. Do it all now. Don't do it progressive. Enjoy it as you go because you're, you're delaying um, the ability to do the things you want to do in, in a way that if your end goal is that long arm kit with 37s or whatever and these shocks, springs, bump stocks, blah, 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 everything that comes with it, um, the, the potential for other problems and issues and delays along the way, right? You, you potentially can create more problems by piecemealing it. Mm-hmm. So I took that to heart to say, I wanted to be able to do everything now. Um, and, and the other piece is, well, you may not be able to do it later. Right. Yeah. So I kind of went all in and I know that's not a everybody, everything philosophy, but at the time I was able to do it. Um, we have a JK um, uh, that is a donor, um, has a cracked block, right? Uh, the owner put 330,000 oh, miles on it. Is that that green one? Yep. And owned it for roughly 10 years. It's a 08. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, Hey, it's yours if you want it. Right. So this one, I set out with a different approach. Ellis we're swap, we're starting on it next month. Car? No, we're <laughs> we're actually going to try to build this into a crawler as cost effective and efficiently as we possibly can. Yeah. Right. Let so, me tell you what. If you do forty fours front and rear, or even better, go find your. I mean, you're mechanically. So the rear on it's already a 44. Yeah, the, the rear is already a 44. Yeah. So so find a a front 44 do 35s and just do but I mean build it build a budget is is two and a half inches of lift. You can do I mean you obviously know you can do everything you want with two and a half inches, three inches of lift and and a good tire. Is it and you it seems like you're a good driver, so driver mod and a good tire is is all you need and the, and the why i preach that is because i'm a big fan of racing i like ultra four and when it comes to ultra four it doesn't get harder than king of the hammers these guys are doing every single trail that these guys on 44 43s 44 stickies tons thousand horsepower in the stock class so you can have it needs to be a stock block yeah stock style suspension no bigger than a 35 oh these guys are doing everything you can do in a 
fully built tube chassis million dollar race car that you can do in a seventy thousand dollar built xj wow but they're on 35s stock style axles stock style suspension points like it's you don't need to have the biggest baddest vehicle to have fun you need to be able to drive your vehicle and if if you can do that with this vehicle is is make it make a drive or something that that challenges you I don't know. Maybe that's not your plan. <laughs> no, it, it's along those lines. Um, because like I said, we, we did one hell of a lot with the stock Rubicon. Yeah. Right. Um, it's only because I wanted to go after the bigger, more aggressive, mm-hmm. higher rated trails. But it is incredibly capable. I was stunned and impressed. My my wife's is a Willys. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I'm even more blown away at what it can do, right? So we went to, uh, I want to say, I think it was Bald Mountain. And she was kind of just starting out. She's always been a passenger. And then we got hers three years after mine. Mm -hmm. Um, And I went to to check out an area to see if it was going to be kind of okay for her where she going to get stuck out there or have a problem. So I go up uh, over this hill, come down, make a loop to come back. And then I see her launch (laughs) into it. And she's doing donuts out there and just like pulls up next to me. And she's like, what's next? Right. To the point that I was like, okay. Um, I don't know if I would have done that. But, you know, there's something to be said for trying to tell your wife how to drive. Yeah. So (laughs) you don't. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we, we... we are a three Jeep family now um, to, to the point that, you know, when we go out on a ride, we've got three Jeeps just between us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with the intention of hitting trails and having a good time and, and doing those things. So um, at the end of the day, it, it's f- from here out, it's it's doing as, as much as we can locally up and down the East Coast. Um hitting the West coast when it's possible, which I think maybe later this year, I do like going out there near the end of the year instead of during the peak. Cause it's so difficult. Like, like you mentioned to deal with all the Jeeps that are there during the season. Um, so yeah, that that's, that's really what I would say is the plan is, is to do more local trails. So in other words, trails within three to four hours versus three to four days. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Uh, and then, build out um, what we're calling the green Jeep. Uh, There's a lottery pool on the names. Hulk is definitely one that's sticking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Slimer is another one that's that's going out there. So this is that 2008. It's called rescue green, but it apparently is the highest. They sold 200,000 of those green Jeeps that year. It is the number one selling color and everybody I've talked to hates it. (laughs) All right, man. I look forward to uh, seeing that build. I'm sure we'll be a part of it at Dart Nerds. But uh, thank you for finally, not finally, but we finally got this to work. We we've been going back and forth for probably six months now, trying to trying to trying to get together and get on the show. We were supposed to do Overland Expo in October, but we you were. Could, you couldn't make that. And then we had a few other plans that we couldn't make. Uh, I'm glad we finally got together, and I'm looking forward to uh, doing it again sometime. Hopefully, in the woods next time. Absolutely. Uh, where can people find you online? What is your What are your tags? So you can find us uh, online uh, through Instagram. Um, we are uh, Sub Zero, all one word, S U B Z E R O dot Jeep J E E P. Um, and one of the one of the next things I, I would say is since we'll have a little time is to start trying to edit that video. Yeah. It's a um, lot of work, but it's, it, it, it is very rewarding to see people. Like I know I was saying, you're not doing it for other people, but to see people enjoying what you did on, on YouTube and everything, it's, it's very rewarding to see that. So it, it's a, it's a weird catch 22 is I don't want to do it for you, but if I'm doing it, I'd like to, I'd like to see people watch it and what having people watch it, and enjoy it is very fun. I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, it's definitely the conversations, the folks. One of the coolest things that I think happened when we launched um, the Instagram 
is the people that were like, hey, I'm just down the road. Do you guys want to join us? And mm-hmm. we did. We yeah. ended up that that is one of the, the the trails that we did with folks. Instagram actually accelerated that in a way that Facebook couldn't or didn't. Yeah. Um, it's a great platform. And that's that's really how we've grown it as a show and as a as a as a brand as the Dirt Nerds is, is through Instagram. It's it's amazing how well it works. Well, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. I know it took a while. There, there was a part of me that, um, you know, what's funny is the last time we were going to do this, I was in Indiana um, doing the trails out there and we just time wise got delayed. Yeah. But uh, it was right around that time that they added the additional trails. So, so we there was a done- part of me that was like, I'd really like to have these done first. <laughs> Fair. All right, man. I appreciate it. Um, go find him, Sub-Zero Jeep, Subzero.jeep on Instagram. Uh, give him a follow. Uh, you guys know where to find us. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I don't know what else. I'm going to have another cup of coffee and a donut, and then we get out of here. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you for being on. I appreciate it. It's fun talking. Thank you. Thank you.